in a company you have people you you can live with and there's people you can live without mm. and you always want to make sure you take care of the people you can't live without hey guys welcome to the bloom next episodes of 2020 but a great lineup set up for you guys uh, as you notice, we got a new location now. We're filming out of Huddle Share Space. It's a new co-working space out of Scarborough. We're operating out of here as well. Uh, but of course, we got to give out a main shout out to MCRO, who continues to be a mainline sponsor for the, for the show and for everything that we do. So remember guys, if you're looking for any apps, if you get made any, make any apps, uh, create any software, definitely consider them in your process. Uh, they do a great job, they support us, and they can definitely support you. Happy 2020, guys. Awesome, we're here with AutoClose. Right, yes. for our, I think this is our 38th episode, right? 38, Dale? I believe so. Yeah, so 38th episode, right? Thank you for coming on. This is our third episode of the new year, yeah. our new space. Um, yeah, we really want to get to know more about you guys because you, you're a very sales focused individual, mm -hmm. right? I mean, as a company, we, we preach about sales, we help companies with sales, and really want to get into your headspace about that. Perfect. Right? So, can you get a little bit more background? Like, uh, about yourself? Yeah, so I mean, how I got into sales is a very interesting story. Um, I actually used to play semi-professional tennis, mm -hmm. had a, a, a Canadian ranking, world ranking, and had to make that decision to try and go pro or get an education. Didn't have much of a choice when my mom told me, uh, you have to go do your MBA. Yeah. So I actually did my MBA in finance um, and then started working downtown at some of the top five mm -hmm. banks here in, in Toronto. Yeah. Um, but I was just always an extrovert. I was always outgoing and, you know, I felt like working at the banks was like, you know, sitting behind a computer desk and you're just, you know, punching numbers. Mm -hmm. So I actually got an opportunity to automatically just be VP of sales for a company. Okay. Skipped everything, went right to VP of sales and they gave me a sales team and they're like, you know, you're outgoing, like teach them, you know, some what of your type tricks. of company? What, what, what it was saying? a computer software company. Okay. Uh, email archiving actually. Um, so they had a few sales guys and that's actually when I first started and I, you know, within my first two weeks, I saw some things that could be improved and that's how I came up with my first business was in the first two weeks of my sales job. Okay. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that? Like what were the problems that you found? Yeah. So the first thing I saw was, you know, as a VP of sales, like here's your budget, go buy a database and email that database to try and bring people to webinars, etc. And I looked at the data and I was giving it to the sales guys, I'm like, guys, the emails are invalid, the phone numbers are wrong, and the company we're buying from, we just spent $10,000 on, and they're one of the biggest companies in the world, like, they can't provide clean data. So what I say, I'm like, well, I'd rather provide quality, um, because I know salespeople are wasting a lot of time, so what I did was, my first company was a data company, mm -hmm. and I copied um, what Jigsaw did, which was acquired from Salesforce, and we built a data company, but the whole goal was to provide high quality data and not a volume of data. Okay. And the strategy really there was, were you built the company to sell it off to somebody else? Like, do you see a different play with that? Like, how, what was the strategy there? Yeah, so initially it was Jigsaw got acquired for a few hundred million dollars. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, if I can just do like 10% of what yeah, they yeah, did, yeah. that would be amazing. And then I'll sell my company. And then I started the company with the exact same model after it was acquired. Um, and then kind of, you know, just kind of slowly built into like, okay, I kind of like this entrepreneur thing. Um, but it gets to a point where you know, I started the business and it almost like I felt like in my head, in my partner's head, we have to now branch off. We have to do something with this, but this is just like the starting point and we have to figure out, okay, what can we build on top of this that will bring another value to our clients? And that's how we got exchange leads, which we ran for two years and then um, built auto close on top of exchange leads. And they, I know they both run side by side with each other because exchange leads gives the data to mm -hmm. the new platform. That's a very interesting way of building a business, right? It's almost like you you discovered one problem, you, you went and solved it, and then, okay, based off of this, it became like a platform to build on, some, on top of something else, and then auto clause on top of that. Yeah, well, the, the thing was, so we had clients would use our data and be like, Sean, Exchange Leads is amazing, the data is great, but we have to find someone else mm. to email it. So I find one thing that you know, everyone nowadays needs to do is consolidate. You can't just rely on one tool, and, and not a sales guy doesn't want to have a tab full of you know, a CRM, a marketing tool, a sales tool, LinkedIn, et cetera. So what we did was we said, okay, we have the data. Now let's build that email automation tool, sales automation tool that can, the data can feed. And now you can email and use the data all in one platform. So it kind of like went side by side and it was almost like became like sister companies. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that process, right? Like when you, when you first started, like you went from a sales guy to an entrepreneur. Yeah. Right. How was that transition? Like? I'll, I'll tell you. I was, uh, I was about, 
31 years old and I actually just <coughs> recently got a girlfriend who's mm -hmm. now my wife. And I was making great money in sales. I was the VP of sales, I was making six figures, but in my heart um, and being an old tennis and very competitive, like I always wanted to own my own thing. I never liked hearing somebody telling me what to do. I like to call the shots. So my first year I worked while I was developing the product and actually I left the six figure job when I made my first $49 subscription recurring revenue with my new platform. So going now from a six figure job to $49 and just having a new girlfriend and saying, Hey honey, I made six figures, but now I'm making four or $9. Like, you know, it was a very big transition. Um, obviously she was very supportive, but, um, it's one of those things that you have to decide, like, you know, if you want to go for it, you got to go for it. Mm. And it was, the, that was the time where I had to go for it. So yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a big transition going from making a lot of money, spending a lot of money to saying, okay, well now you're not making a lot of money. You got to save and you got to pay your rent, et cetera, here in Toronto, but you're going to build a platform. And you know, I'm one of those guys who's very confident. So I knew whatever, um, whatever I put in and whatever I want to build, I'll build it. Yeah. So when I made that $49, it was an exciting day. But uh, there was some peaks and valleys through that transition till today. Absolutely. I mean, what is one of the biggest things is being a salesperson is <clears throat> it becomes the, it, there's a huge ego driven aspect behind it, which is like the part of your income, right? Yeah. It's like I I won this. This is mine, right? Like because with sales, one of those one of those uh, fields where you have direct metrics on your performance. Yeah. Unlike other jobs where you can just sit there and like you know you, you get a paycheck. With sales, you can quantify your results and get paid for it with bonuses, commissions, all those kind of things. So when you leave that kind of atmosphere into like an entrepreneurship, you lose those kind of those value, like those like uh, quantitative matrix, right? I feel like your ego kind of dies a little bit in that kind of sense, right? You have to get used to that kind of environment. Like, was there like a mental transition for you? There was a big mental transition. And to be honest, it was almost a breakdown. Yeah. Um, and what exactly happened was, it wasn't that I wasn't selling, but I was selling for my own company. So my first year, I took no salary. Yeah. So no matter what I sold, when you sell for a company, like you see that, that commission check come in with me, I was selling, I was selling to you know, Rogers. I was selling to big clients here in Canada, but I didn't feel it because all the money would stay in the company and mm -hmm. I'd reinvest in the company and hire more people. So even though I'm selling, I don't actually, I never I got the gratification of selling. Yeah. Um, and it, it was about a year ago where I said to myself, or a year and a half ago when I started articles, I said to myself, like, like, I feel like I'm working 14 hour days. I'm building two businesses and I'm like, I'm not getting anything out of it. Yeah. And like, it's not like the company wasn't making money. So then I said, okay, now I'm taking a commission off all my sales. Cause originally it was just me selling. Yeah. So there was a big transition. It was, it was a, there was a mental block because as you said, you can feel it when you're a salesperson, yeah. but when you're an entrepreneur, it's like you, you're making money, but you're not feeling it because yeah. you're keeping the money in the company. Yeah. It's like you're growing a different baby. You're growing, you're like, it's, um, it's like a child you're developing almost, right? It's, it's an entity oh, yeah. and like all your resources are going to go towards there. And you're like, wait, what about me? Right. So well, how's that transition like when you start taking that salary? Like a lot of like business leaders are talking about that, right? Like make sure you pay yourself first. Yeah. And it, there's always counters to the other leadership qualities, right? Make sure you pay your employees first and feed growth first, right? And what your investors want and what, like the bottom line is to grow the company, right? Yeah. How do you play amongst that? Like when do you know when to start drawing a salary? When do you know um, how much is enough? Like, yeah, I mean, Everyone could say you should start taking a salary right away, but you're not making money right away. Like if you want to grow a business, you can't say, okay, say your first year, you make $50,000 profit, but I'm gonna pay myself 50. You can't, you can't do that. So yeah. what I did strategically, um, and I would recommend anyone do this is whenever you want to become an entrepreneur, you want to have that safety. And so, as I said, I, I only made, I went from a six figure job to making four nine ninety nine. However, throughout that year when I was developing my product, I saved six months of rent in my pocket. So I knew when I left for that $49, I had six months that I can live my life, pay my rent in downtown Toronto, which is expensive yeah. for my condo and still start a business. So I gave myself that six months. And at that point, after that, for the first year, I just said to myself, like I would, it was helping because I was spending less and stuff, but I needed to reinvest and get good people because you can hire anybody, but what I think you can spend a lot of money and waste a lot of money doing is finding the wrong people just because you need the people. So I would recommend take the salary when you start to need it. Like I knew a few years ago where I wanted to buy a house or I want you, you know, if you want to get married and you have to buy an engagement ring, stuff like that. But from the beginning, if you want to start a business, you have to reinvest into the business and reinvest into your people. And then when the time is right, 
I would start taking a salary, obviously not take a big one, but yeah. slowly increase that as your revenue continues to increase. Yeah. And the main thing, main thing is like for the average person, it's insanely difficult of a concept of not taking a salary or not having something coming in. Yeah. How are like friends and families, like how are the close individuals around you um, when you made this transition? Yeah. So, um, I mean, <clears throat> I'm one of those guys, I, I, I don't really listen to what Tim's, like I'll do, I know what I you can You kind of have to be sometimes. I'm, yeah. I'm, I know what I can perform. Yeah. And I, I know if I, whatever I've started my entire life, I've always succeeded. And when I started playing tennis, you know, my goal was to be top three in Canada and I became top three in Canada. I wanted to be top 250 in the world, I was top. So whatever I put my head to, I do. But what I also did was I was, I was more of an entrepreneur at a very young age. So before I even started both these businesses, while I was working, I had another business that was paying my rent money. Mm. So I started that when I just finished my MBA, my first co-op, I was starting um, selling packaging from the Orient. So I, had some, I was getting cosmetic packaging from the Orient, just bringing it here, distributing it to my clients here. And I wasn't making a lot back then. I'd make you know, 1,000 a month, 2,000 a month, whatever it was, but that would pay my rent. Mm. So I continued, I still to this day, that's the third business I still run. And now those, those clients that had $1,000 are doing a lot more business, but I always made sure I was making money in other ways um, so that I would never be, you know, you would never be stranded unless you're hurt for money. But it was a transition. Um, Definitely, you know, can't go for those nice dinners and those nice travels yeah. for six months, but you have to, you know, put your head down and really grind it out. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's really cool that you talked about, like, you know, building multiple business, multiple streams of income. Um, I mean, that, that's a very strategic approach to a lot of life. A lot of people are still miss out on that kind of opportunity. They see it as like a business as an all-in thing. Yep. They don't see it as a continuing entity that can, like, you know, produce income for you or be an income generator. Um, when did that idea first come to you? Like... So I'm, you know, I'm one of those guys that I, I always like to learn, like do, do different things. The cosmetic thing was something I, I did then. And then, you know, when I started to make a little bit of money with exchange leads, I always say, you know, don't keep money in the bank. Mm. So I, I started to buy condos in Toronto. And you, you know, just put, putting down payments down. And, you know, so I think you have to diversify, to diversify and you can't say, okay, because if your business, if everything's in one business and doesn't succeed, you know, you're done. You have to go back to the drawing board. But if you have multiple streams, multiple different ways to get revenue, um, it, only, it only helps. But you have to do things that doesn't need much of your attention. Like my cosmetic business right now is I get an order. All I do is hire DHL, drive the package to Ajax, to my distributor, drive it to Pickering, drive it here. So it doesn't have to take my attention. Yeah. My business takes my full attention. But the other stuff like real estate and stuff where you can, you, know, you can buy real estate and then rent out the condo and just collect a check every month and pay the bank, whatever the mortgage and et cetera is is a way to get another stream of income. So you have to, you, just like in sales, I tell you, you can't rely on one channel, you can't rely on one stream of income. Absolutely. And before, like, you dropped a really big fact here, like number three in Canada in tennis. Yeah. But, like, can you talk a little more about that? Like, that's, that's pretty exciting. So, yeah, I used to, used to play uh, profession, semi-professional tennis until okay. I was about 18. And then I had to make that decision. Um, at that point, there was never a Canadian tennis player that actually made a career out of tennis, like mm. made enough money in tennis. Now, I mean, Canada's probably, I think, you know, we have some of the best tennis players in the world. Bianca just won a championship. We have Denis Shapovalov, um, Milos Raonic, and other people. But it was a decision my mom kind of said to me. She goes, well, listen, Sean, you can try and go the tennis route. You are number two in Canada. But if you get injured, which you get injured a lot, you're not going to have anything to fall back on. So a lot of the people that I play tennis with that went the tennis route that didn't become professional ended up being tennis coaches. Yeah. Nothing against tennis coaches. Um, but that was the only thing they can fall back to. But she goes, or you can go the alt, you know, the MBA route, get an education, and then you know, work at a bank and work somewhere. You can still try and play tennis, but the chance of becoming pro were slim to none. So um, mm. let's just say I didn't have much of a choice. I was kind of pushed one direction, but it was the best decision I've ever made. Okay. I do miss tennis. Though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how old are you when you were playing? I, I played. I played competitively till I was eighteen, mm -hmm. and then I taught tennis from 18 to 27 mm -hmm. while I was doing my MBA. Um, and that is probably why I am, tennis is where I am. I'm an entrepreneur only because of tennis. Because okay. what I networked through tennis, all the people I met through tennis, um, all the businesses I met through tennis, the CEOs, it was all through networking through tennis. Yeah, I mean, this is something that people don't really realize much, right? When you are like, a, like an athlete or a musician or artist or at such a high performing rate, I mean, the network you kind of create 
I mean, you can utilize for life afterwards, oh, right? A hundred percent. So I, yeah. so I did my MBA and, uh, and it was funny. So we did a co-op MBA program mm -hmm. and there was three co-ops and this, we went to McMaster and they put like a, you know, a list of jobs out. They said, okay, we're going to start job looking from January 21st to March 21st. The day before January 20th, they're like, oh, I got a job. And it was all from who I met through mm -hmm. tennis. So every kid I taught tennis to over here in Hawks Hollow, what does your father do? What does your mother do? Oh, my, my mother does this. My, my dad's a Toronto Maple Leaf. Yeah, had, wow. I, I taught three Maple Leaf kids tennis. Amazing. Another one is uh, CI Financial, CEO of CI. So I ended up getting a co-op at CI Financial. Yeah. Um, other person was a VP at RBC. I got my co-op at VP as a RBC. So I would say tennis, but any sport in general, A, it makes you competitive, but B, it's the best way to network. Yeah, it's interesting way of putting it. Like sports is a way to network. Oh, it's, right? it's uh, I think I was talking to, to Henry earlier and I was saying, when I look at somebody's resume, for any sales job support, I always look. First thing I look for is, have they played a sport? Because if they've played a sport, they're competitive and they either love to win or they hate to lose. Yeah, and yeah. that's what you want in a salesperson. That's a really good way of putting it. I mean, I work in sales uh, actually for like 12 years of my life. And 100% yeah. finding those competitive people, um, they definitely stand out. But my last uh, position I worked at where we were doing, like, it was a sales team of 60 people, full commission, yeah. right? Working on smart home automation, selling like, smart home automation gear. And uh, my manager at the time, like we talked about it, right? Like we're in an age now where it's more like empathy sells better than aggression. Yeah. Where people who can make connections with people and make relationships are selling, right? And we toyed about it, like where can we find people like this, right? And we joked about it, like the best way to find like a salesperson would be at a club. Yeah. Because what's a better sale than somebody who can, you know, <laughs> you know, get a date out of it. Yeah. Right. Whether it be man or girl. Right. Like, and one of the things we also find out in sales is that the, the female, the, it's, it's actually a male dominant industry, but the females who are in it completely dominate. Like they're so oh. good. Uh. Right. Because they can create those relationships and build that. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, can we talk about like that, 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 like the transition between uh, two sales from sports? Like, was that intentional or did you end up there because of? Yeah. So. I think, you know, so I worked, I worked a bit of retail, you yeah. know, in sales, so like, for example, I worked at, you know, a place called Sporting Life in Toronto and like they were giving it, I think when I was working, they were like, okay, the, whoever sells the most this month gets $50. And I was like, $50. Like yeah. I was like, I don't know, 17, 16, 17, 18. Yeah. And like, I would literally go department to department and it was like, it was like, it was competitive for me. So, yeah, yeah. so sales to me is, you know, A, I love stealing my competitor's business. B, I, I love you know, winning. So if somebody says, Oh, I don't need that product. Like in me, it's like, it's a game. Like I need to figure out a way, how can I make that person want my product? And you know, how can I show them the value in the product? So yeah. going to sales was pretty easy because even as a tennis coach, you're still selling. Mm. There's four coaches. There's one person that walks in that says, I want a tennis lesson. Which of those four coaches are going to be the one that is going to jump in and say, Hey, well, let me help you on your back end or what, you know, is it your forehand back end or serve? Like what's your weakness? Oh, perfect. That's a, I, you know, so it was always a sales game. So when I got into, when I got into sales was kind of like, you know, I was in finance and like, I goes, well, with your personality and your experience, like you should try sales. And I got into sales and I just like, it was always networking and I can still, you know, use your personality. And as you said it nowadays, sales is all about relationships. If you're not building relationship, I think on LinkedIn and mm -hmm. in person, you know, you're not going to succeed in sales these days. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I feel like the internet has really democratized information. Yeah. So people are forced now to be like, you know what, this is who the real me was. Like, part of the reason why sales gets a bad rap is like, is that the past sales used to be taking advantage of people's um, uh, lack of information. Yeah. Right. The lack of knowledge. Right. You you position yourself as a leader and like, hey, listen, this is what I recommend you, and you take advantage of a knowledge gap to get get a short win, and that's predominantly what sales is known for: those short wins. And nowadays, like, you know, you, you, you want to do business with somebody, they can quickly Google you. Yeah. Right. The Google reviews are there, right. Your LinkedIn is there, your, you know, your connections are there. You can easily find out information about somebody. Yeah. So it's almost like, okay, I can't do the short wins anymore. Right. And that has changed the industry. Now sales has changed more into like an empathy game. Right. But you know, showcasing about yourself, giving yourself, showing what your personality is about, what you believe in, what the causes of your behind. Right? Like what are your ideas? You're trying to connect yeah. with people as much as possible. Then they want that connection before they make a transition with you, right? Oh, a hundred percent. I think um, it was funny because I, I, I was recently looking for, for a car mm -hmm. and I go to the, the car dealerships and I was like, 
the car dealerships are still those old sales guys like, oh, that car is terrible. Like you want this car. But nowadays it's all about, um, like I'll tell you one of the strategies we do. We'll, you know, we'll look on, for example, you know, a lot of males in the few US love football. They love mm-hmm. NFL football. Yep. So my sales guys, when there's a Monday night <clears throat> football game, say it could be Baltimore versus Minnesota, Baltimore wins the game. Well, my salespeople are on the phones, on LinkedIn, and reaching out to every person in Baltimore mentioning that Monday night football game. Why? Because now you're building that relationship and saying, oh, that Baltimore Ravens game, that was a great game yesterday, they won. And you'll see how many more replies you'll because you found that kind of that nugget. You need to yeah. find a nugget. And a lot of it's on LinkedIn. You can find if somebody likes tennis. I get reached out to my people say, oh, I, I see you play tennis. And they just reach out to me. I will more reply to somebody that finds something about me mm-hmm. than somebody that just sends me some sort of sales message of and course. says, let's connect because we're both in sales. No, yeah. like say, Sean, I used to play tennis myself. Actually, my kid's just getting into tennis. I'd love to connect to share ideas and networks. That kind of stuff works nowadays, but just kind of being salesy. There are people that do it still though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. I think it's kind of like uh, the field itself is changing still, but yeah. people, people, still, people still focusing on the old way of doing it. Like, do you follow like Gary Vee or any of those kind of new age kind of uh, thought leaders on this? I do follow them all. Um, I mean, for example, I follow Grant Cardone as well. Grant Cardone, yeah. But do I love his sales approach? No. Do I like certain things he does? Yeah, but I'm all about, I don't like, one thing I always teach my salespeople also mm. is don't ever put your competitors down. Don't ever talk bad about your competitors. Because my competition have great products, mm-hmm. but you got to find what is the difference between yours and their product. And I find a lot of them are like they're fake a little bit. Like like Grant Cardone might post something on on his, on his Instagram talking about you know he's interviewing somebody in Miami and then 20 minutes later he's on a he's he's in Dubai. It's like like people just post content without actually knowing like is that real? Are you really in Dubai? Are you really in Miami? Um, but they are listen they're they're great influencers. They're great in social media, but I don't agree with everything. I guess. Mm. Um, from those guys. Gary Vee, I do love a lot. Okay, but, okay. But Grant Cardone and some other guys are not, not, not as Perfect. Much. Okay. Um, do you still play tennis? Funny enough, I played last week for the first time in five years. Okay. And let me just say the, sho- the shoulder from serving was not good the next day. Oh, so no, I, uh, I play, it's funny, I can play, but like I can't just rally. Like when I go in, it's like, okay, I haven't played in five years. The first thing I want to do is like, let's play a set. Yeah. Even though it's probably not the best thing to do, but I'm so competitive that, uh, I just like to either, I want to win or lose. I don't want to practice. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I played <laughs> last week, um, but I definitely need to get back into it. Yeah. Because it's uh, it was definitely a lot of fun back in the day. No, definitely. Like, I really like the idea of like how much you like combining to get this, you love the sport and, and the sales, right? Like the, the win loss, calculating all that. Like as like a salesperson, like how well do you respond to these metrics, right? Like it's one of the things that salespeople I find like they can't get enough of is like the metrics they can, they yeah. can pull. Um, like, you're probably using dashboarding apps and all this stuff to follow this. Like, how do you manage your time and um, motivate yourself? So that's, that's a great question. You know, it's something that I would say was uh, a big mistake when I started out becoming an entrepreneur. I was so focused on let's grow the company, let's grow our revenue, but I wouldn't actually see what are the KPIs of each person in my company. So my salespeople, like, you know, did you get any demos? Oh yeah, we did. How many? Like, I didn't care. But so what we recently did was like built all those KPIs, and now every week I get a report. So say for example. You know, this sales rep's got to close ten thousand dollars this week. If he closed eight, all I can just see is an report. Why? Like, why did you miss it? So I think metrics are extremely important because a your sales reps, your marketing people want to make sure that they are doing a good job, and they don't know they're going to be doing a good job unless you actually can see the dashboard. Um, so it's become a big part of our business now is actually monitoring. And I look at it once a month. So my my CMO kind of sends it to me. I breeze through it. I see who's at above 100%, who's below 100%. I ask the team leads, why is she below 100%? Why is he above? Is it the time of the month? Is it the holiday season, et cetera? But mm-hmm. um, looking at, you have to look at metrics. If you're not looking at metrics, it was a big mistake I didn't do my, I didn't in our first year. Um, and, and now that we're doing it, it's so important for the business. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, how do, what do you do like to motivate salespeople? Like that's a whole job in itself. Yeah. Right? See, a lot of people talk about motivation. At the end of the day, when I was in sales, I like money. Yeah, money. Like, it's like, enough. like yeah. give me money. Like I used to, oh, I'll give you a gift certificate to Starbucks. I don't want coffee. Like, give me cash. So what we do is, um, I have plans. We have, you know, commission plans. We have salaries for our sales guys. But if they make a good sale, they'll just see at the end of the month. I just throw bonuses. 
Mm -hmm. And I find that money is the best way to motivate people. It's the best way to motivate me. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they have their, their, their certain KPIs they have to reach. And even, you know, some of our SDRs, if they hit that number, if they overpass that number. But sometimes I don't even need to see the KPIs. I can just be like, I can look at somebody and kind of like see their interactions with our company in Slack and stuff. And I could be like, you know, this guy's working above and beyond. Like, you know, he deserves something. So I just kind of throw bonuses around. There nice. should probably be a process for that, but I just kind of throw it around whenever I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's 100%. Like these competitions, like, uh, like uh, metric based rewards, right, go a long way. Sales yeah. can really resonate with all that. Because, again, like sales is one of the few jobs where you have direct feedback on how you're doing. You have all these metrics in front of you. You're like, you know, you're putting this much input in, this is what your output is. Yeah. Right? You know how effective you are, yeah. how effective you're being. Um, do you find that, like, your people are self motivated or like group motivated? Like, how does this team function? That is an amazing question because that is a conversation I had two days ago. Um, and what we recently did was we used to give each salesperson would have commission, their salary, etc. But we now put a component, like you said, a team component. Mm. So now our SDRs each say have to get, they have to book 20 demos a month of autoclose. Okay. If they, if one person hits 18 and one person hits 22, <coughs> they get their, they, the, the 22 will get paid. However, if they both hit 20, there's now a, a structure in there that they both get paid on the team. So what that does is at the, during the month, if one person's lagging behind, they're motivating each other. So now it's like, you, you know, I, I always believe you're building a company, but you're building a family. Mm -hmm. um, and to, for them to be a family, they have to help each other. So that kind of something we just recently did it. And the team loves it because now, you know, I can see in our Slack that, you know, one of our sales reps is, is involved in coaching them. Okay. This is the message you got from LinkedIn, write this. And they're helping each other get more demos and yeah. it only helps the business. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. The team environment in sales is so crucial. Yeah. Right? The company that really get it. Like a lot of companies, like, like I hate, like the toxic culture really comes from when you cannot, like, ha like you know, like not even have a conversation, can't even, you can't even have a conversation with somebody, but like can't even motivate or yeah. work alongside somebody else, right? A lot of companies silo out people to be like, focus on yourself, focus on your own metrics, yeah. run this independently, right? And literally, you want that bilateral, so like the, the knowledge share, where people are like, yo, I tried this, I tried this, why don't you try this, right? And it's, so it's like, almost like you're, you're like, you're trying to find your way in into something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You're like picking away at it, you're trying to find a, uh, the best way into a problem set, right? How to fit that puzzle piece in. And if you are, like, how to mold that puzzle piece into that, into that, into that uh, groove. And the more nimble you are, the more tools you have, yeah. the more knowledge share you have, Right, the better, the more flexible the team is. Yeah, and, and also it helps with you know promoting people internally, right? Mm. So if you have a if you have a good team and one person is really you know crushing the other SDR, like okay, maybe move that person into a team lead, give them a little few extra dollars, and now have them train exactly how did he get twenty two and the other person's getting eighteen. Yeah, train the people below. So you have kind of that, um, that umbrella effect, that snowball effect that kind of goes down, um, and that's kind of how you motivate. So we you know we always have people start off you know, in support, learn the product, go from support to customer success. Then after customer success, you go into sales. So it's kind of a process. So not only you're learning yeah. the product the whole way through, but now I can put you in any different department inside the company and you have experience there. That's amazing. Yeah. It's really amazing. That's actually a smart way to put them, like, put them to that guide path. Um, but like, again, that you touched on like one of the, like, the holy problems in sales, right? It's like, just because you're good at sales doesn't mean you're good at managing people. Yeah. And a lot of times, again, because it's such a value-based field, when you get a high amount of sales, that gets you lined up for a promotion, yeah. right? So. Sales rather than other any other industry or like other fields where you move up based on seniority or like you know amount of work you've done or a particular milestones you've reached. With sales, you have a direct correlation almost yeah. to how you get promoted or move up in the company. But the problem is your skill sets change the more you move up. Yeah. Right? When you go from a salesperson who's converting leads and doing all this to managing people and helping them do it, I mean, not every manager is made equal. Oh yeah. Right? So how does that, that, that transition work for you? Or have you seen that? In your company or other companies? Yeah, so you know, everyone has their own um, own personality. I, I find like you can have the best salesperson, but they might be a terrible leader. Mm -hmm. You might have the best salesperson, but they don't know how to, you know, teach something. Like for example, I'll tell you myself. When I started out, I was I was great at running a business, but mm -hmm. I wasn't great at managing seven people. When we had seven originally. I couldn't manage it. I just you know, the SDR is okay, we have a 15 minute call. I'd literally be doing something else while they're talking about, okay, perfect, yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. Good dog, good job today. But some people aren't made to be leaders. Yeah. Some people are good to be at sales. And which is why, you know, I, I see companies that all the time is like, they'll, 
they'll automatically promote like a senior person sales to a team lead. But they might not be a team or a regional sales manager, like or a national sales manager. Like a sales rep that's managing Toronto might not be good at managing every single person in every province because when you're man when you're your own sales rep, you get paid on what you do. But when you're a manager now, you're getting paid to make sure every person under you is performing and hitting their quota. Yeah. So now it doesn't matter if you sell, it's mattering if those other seven people under you sell. And if you're not good at, good at being a leader and you can't train them properly, you might not get paid out because the people under you aren't performing. Yeah. So there is a, that you have to be able to find the right people that you can promote. And I think, you know, especially I find this not only in, in our company, but in, in general is you have a, in a company, you have people you, you can live with and there's people you can live without. Mm. And you always want to make sure you take care of the people you can't live without. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a definitely a correlation, but it's something that you have to, uh, you have to manage inside the organization. Absolutely. And one of the, again, another problem with sales is, is like sometimes, um, the toxic culture of it, right? Where the top salesperson thinks they're untouchable or thinks they're special, right? And they start doing things their own way, their own processes, and it kind of alienates the rest of the team. Um, and again, just because of the nature of sales, the per people know how valuable they are, oh, yeah. it affects their egos. Right, how you had to deal with that kind of negative culture? Oh, I thought that we had a perfect example inside our organization. Yeah. When we started, before we started to grow, I had one guy that was, we call, we call them closers or mm. account managers or, you know, the SDRs feed them leads. And he was closing everything. So it'd be me and him closing and he was great at it. He still is amazing at it, still works for us. However, when you, he was, he thought he was on top of the world, but then you bring somebody else into that closer role, a younger person, maybe 20 years younger, uh, kind of hustler, money motivated, you bring him in, and then in, within the first two months, he's beating my other sales rep with a revenue. Well, now this person's like, whoa, like, like I thought I was killing it, but like this guy just came in, because there was no numbers we can compare to. Yeah. But then you bring a second person in, watch how both now get motivated. And it's, it's a little competition between, yep. but that's where you put that team function and we say, listen, both of your, here's your quota. If you both hit it, you're both getting paid this. If one of you hit it, that person only gets it. So um, I've seen it inside my organization. It's it's tough because you know you have to distribute leads now. Instead of having a full pie, you have half the pie, um, but it definitely motivates the salespeople. Yeah, that's really inter interesting. Like, this is an insurance company again, Salesforce insurance company that um, one of my friends works at. He talks about his internal culture, and it's like the top performer is so high level. It's almost like she has her own mini company inside, <laughs> like with like three, four of her own assistants and like. Yeah. You know, pretty much, like nobody talks to her. Yeah, she's a, like an untouchable queen yeah, that comes yeah. and goes and does yeah. what she wants. And the disparity of wealth between like the bottom level and the top level is so big. But the way they describe it is like the the sales company, the organization is built as a shell. Yep, it provides leads, provides support, provides actual support, and these individual salespeople are are put in to be problem solvers. Yep, it's like you do what you got to do. This is the framework you got to work in. But if you evolve and figure something out, perfect. Stick to that. But under this pipeline, bring it in and close deals and you get your payout. Yeah. Right. And you find this natural shift of people, right? Like this, the 20, 80 percent of human, humanity is so real, right? Like you get any population, 20 percent will do 80 percent of the productivity. Yep. And in sales culture, again, like the, the, the drastic shift, the bigger the team gets, the disparity in like the bottom performer and the top performer More just goes up. Too. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Right. So have you seen that yet? Have you experienced that kind of change where like come people just stick to a lower end and they, they stay in this kind of same place? Other end people just soar to the top. Yes. Yeah, so so I, I, but again, I think that's it comes back to how competitive is that person? So, for example, we've had we had one person that was in our she was started off with exchange leads as a data person, moved into auto flows <clears throat> as customer support. And she worked so hard, but she was doing so many things. And in my head, I'm like, you know what? She deserves a promotion. She's been in this position for two years. I get an email literally while I'm thinking of promoting her. Hey, you know, I'd like to have a call with you because I'd like to move into customer success. So I think those kind of people that are self more like, you're going to get companies that are going to say, okay, I'd like to promote you, but go and get it yourself. Mm -hmm. Like if you want to be promoted and you think you deserve to get promoted, like go to your manager and be like, hey, this is, this is where my short, my three, five, 10 year goal is in life in, sale, in working. In three years, I want to be customer success. In five years, I want to be sales. In 10 years, I want to be VP of sales. So she came up to us, but then we have other people. It's like, you know, it's just like, it's a nine to five day. They come in, they roll out. They don't want to learn. You can get them courses. You can get them a CRM. They don't want to learn a CRM. You can yeah. teach them, 
you know, you say go on a podcast, they don't even know what a podcast, like, so you just yeah. gotta like, you have the people that don't wanna grow and then you have the people that are really anxious. The ones that are really anxious, those are the ones you wanna keep. Yeah, yeah. The ones who are anxious to, to grow. Exactly. That's yeah. an interesting way of putting it. Yeah. Right? Um, people who are comfortable, they're the ones you gotta keep an eye out, you think? Well, those are the, those are the ones that are comfortable, they'll be with you forever, but they'll never wanna do it above and beyond. Like we have, you know, we have somebody that's been with us for five years and like, you gotta know the person. So I know if I give her like an extra two hours of work a week, like she'll get anxious. She's like, this is what you do. And she's done the same thing for five years and wow. she hasn't changed. Yeah. But if you give her any more, she'll start complaining. If she give her any less, she'll, like she need, she knows what she wants to do. She's comfortable. She clocks in at nine, she leaves at five. She gets all her work done, all her projects done, but you can't give her any more than what she's already doing. Mm. So like, I think, I feel like there's like a huge base of population are like that. Right, they're comfortable in exactly what yeah. their role is and they want to stay within that kind of comfort zone. And this is the ones that are most susceptible to automation. Yep. Right, they end up in those roles that are easily automated all the way. And this is the people that should be fearful and sometimes are. And they can yeah. see the world shifting around them, right? So how has the automation affected you and the company? Like you have so much sales tools now and CRMs and everything yep. built out. Like on top of what you have technologies built in, you're probably using multiple technology solutions yourself. Right, so how has that shifted your part? Auto we it? use so much automation. We try and automate everything. Um, well, there's a few reasons. A, you know, we're a bootstrap company taking no investments. B, um, you know, as you grow from, well, as a small business, <coughs> people have to wear many hats. Mm. So we have everything automated. When somebody signs up, it goes through a payment, then it goes into our accounting, then it goes into reconcile. Even with, you know, LinkedIn automation, we, and we, have, we have sales automation, we have marketing automation. So we automate as much as we can because then you could take away some of the tedious tasks a sales rep or a marketing rep or a marketing person would have to do on a daily basis. They still have a role to do. They still have the numbers they have to hit. But you can never eliminate a person. Like people say, you know, soon you're not going to need, you're always going to need sales reps. But you can automate those tedious tasks like follow-ups. Like salespeople hate doing follow-ups. They give up after one or two. The person didn't answer their phone. I sent an email, they never replied, but nobody replies to one email now. Mm -hmm. They're getting 200 emails the same day. So you have, to, you, have to, you have to be persistent, not annoying, but you have to automate as much as you can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, it, you're, you're, more, you're forced to become more of a strategy player than you are like of an course. operator, yeah. right? So use these SaaS tools to actually operate on your behalf, right? But then you strategize on how they all kind of work together and, and function. And I think this is one of the most difficult parts of, like, uh, of work right now, right? Like, how, how to figure out how that automation tree looks like. How, how does that overall strategy look like? Um, for you guys, did you develop in-house yourselves or like did you get outside support? So uh, I was lucky, my, so we just transitioned, my marketing, my marketing person um, was doing all the automations for us. Now he just became the, he, you know, he wanted to grow inside a company, so he's now moved from marketing over to sales, mm -hmm. actually, funny enough, as of January 1st. But we did it all in-house. We audit, we, from the beginning, we automated everything because if we didn't automate everything, I'd have to hire 20 more people and have yeah. 20 more salaries. But as much as you can automate early on, and you can automate everything nowadays, try and automate as much as you can, but you always just gotta tweak it. Tweak oh, you gotta keep playing with it, right? Keep playing with everything. You know, mm -hmm. We have a CRM, you know, tweak it. If you wanna, you know, wanna tag people as a certain thing in your CRM, like, and you wanna call one, you know, a cold prospect, warm prospect, hot prospect, and then change it to, you know, podcast, guest, whatever you want. You just gotta keep changing things around. But once you get that process in place, and it, it, it doesn't happen overnight, it could take a year, it could take two years to get the whole process and automation in place. Your business will run a lot more fluently and then your team can focus on the bigger projects that will actually bring you more revenue. Amazing. So one of the things that uh, we, we do actually as a company is, is um, sales engineering process engineering, like a lot yeah. of companies. This is actually, a lot of our clients have asked this for us. Yeah. Like we actually build this as a service to fit a need that companies keep asking us for, is how do I set up my, my, my processes? How do I set up, something as basic as like, how do I set up my CRM? Yeah. To how do I create a playbook for my salespeople? What's, what's all that look like? Um, and it's becoming more of a need just because of process automation, yeah. right? Someone needs that, that overall strategic outlook of how your company's gonna automate and what are the trigger points and how it's gonna function with the process chain. Like, it, it, most companies are not able to do that in-house, right? Do you have like a in-house person in charge of this or is everybody equally in charge? So everything right now is in-house. So we have our, um, all of our CRM stuff is done through our, through my marketing guy and mm -hmm. then my, my, my co-founder partner, all the other integrations. So 
um, all the financial stuff, every, everything automation wise is done in house. So um, uh, like by that, I mean, do each comp individual person like look at tools that can make their jobs easier and bring it up to higher levels? Like, you know what I mean? Like how does that work? Is it democratize a search for new tools? Perfect. So anyone can bring up new tools, they bring it to their team lead and then their team lead brings it to me and we see if it fits in the budget. So what's the qualification? criteria like how do you decide what kind of tools are well I hold people accountable so what yeah. I do is if you want a new tool and it's gonna cost me 200 bucks a month I go to you I go are you gonna get $200 more revenue a month mm -hmm. if you say no well unless it, unless it's for brand awareness where you can't it's not a dollar value but if it's for a sales guy and he says I want this tool I'm like okay well if I move with your, your quote up an extra 1500 are you, are you confident you can get it mm -hmm. if they say yes no problem now if I buy that tool for them and they don't it's on them yeah. Right. So I hold everyone accountable. I have no problem. I'm very easy. I love trying new things, you know, because because nowadays you don't have to spend much money on these automation tools. Mm -hmm. There's so many tools you can do for social media or anything <coughs> that cost you five bucks a month, ten bucks yeah. a month, twenty bucks. I mean, I look at our credit card. I'm like, I don't even know what some of these tool names are. Yeah. And there's all these different automation tools. But if you're not using them, it's one thing. If you are using them, I want to know. Okay, what am I? What 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 are we getting out of it? And if you can't explain what you're going to get out of it before we buy it, you're not getting it. Can I ask, like, what's an average amount of uh, tools you're using like, per month? Like, do you have a number? <laughs> tools we're paying for, tools we're using are probably doing different. Tools we're paying for. <laughs> tools you're paying for. Tools we're paying for. I would have to say we have anywhere between 20 to 40. 20 to 40. And this is for like a 40 person company. Yeah, but I'm talking, I'm talking there could be tools like social media tools, or, you know, Calendly, for example. Yeah. You have Zoom for screen sharing, um, you know, CRMs. Um, just about, you know, we have Buffer, we have something for signatures, something for landing pages, something for graphics, every tool. So marketing has their own their own set, sales have their own set, but, um, you know, Sales Navigator on LinkedIn is another tool, so there, there's just a ton. I, someone I look at that credit card, like every quarter, I'd be like, so how many of these um, are we actually still using? Oh, we haven't used that one in about 18 months. Okay, well, let's cancel yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Happens all the time. Yeah, yeah. you end up paying for a tool that you're not, you're not using and stuff like that. Oh, so we, we we were paying for two CRMs for a while. I'm like, we're not using Infusionsoft anymore. Why are we paying for it? So oh, I forgot to cancel it. <laughs> so how did that work? Like whenever you add into tools like this, especially like a new CRM, yeah. it's process disruption, right? It's almost like it creates chaotic environments, yeah. right? For us, like, I mean, for a 40 person company, I mean, you guys are still big enough to feel that kind of process disruption. Like, how do you deal with that? Like the changes. So because of our first, the first company, um, we tested, we had like four different CRMs. So since we moved to this one, um, we have not changed anything because just changing our accounting software or our CRM, that's a four month project. Yeah. Like that's a huge transition. And not only that, if you have a veteran salesperson, that's like teaching a baby something new and mm. just doesn't like an old guy that, uh, an older salesperson that works for us. Like if I had to teach him a brand new CRM, it's going to take me two months to teach him after we put the process in. Yeah. So we've built everything, but you know, for example, can our CRM be better than what we're using right now? Yeah. Can our accounting software be better than what we're using? 100%. But I don't have four or five months to make that transition because we don't have the team and it's doing what it has to now. But as we continue to grow and expand and our user base expands and, and stuff, I mean, well, there's always transitions, but uh, mm -hmm. we'll wait for that time, hopefully Absolutely. later than sooner. <laughs> so, I mean, as someone who's so used to transition and being so agile, like as you grow as a firm, you become slower. You have to, yeah. the process all catch up. And like you said, like transition becomes more costly, right? Like how did that transition affect you as a founder, right? Not being as agile enough, does it put you in an anxious situation? Yeah, so this actually happened recently. I just, um, it was actually my, my marketing guy who sat me down and goes, listen, Sean, you're gonna burn out. Yeah. He goes, you're just, like I'm, I, I don't micromanage, but I'm involved in everything. Mm. I get every email that goes through, oh, wow. every, I go into you know, support. I see everything on my email. And I was involved, like, you know, because after 5 p.m. we have no support, I'm going in and I have a, an Elias name, not my name. Yeah. But I'm in there as a, a, a you know, like a support guy in there answering questions. He's like, Sean, you have to structure the company that you can't do everything. You got to focus on, tra you know, traveling, doing podcasts like this or traveling to conferences and getting the name out there, the brand, and then work on your personal brand. Yeah. So what I've done now is I've put team leads in every department. So now instead of 40 people coming to me with everything, I only talk to five people. Those five people talk to people into them. And on our Monday morning meeting, all five people come to me and then I make the decision, but I don't have to be involved and, um, and talk to the other 30 people in the organization. So we just implemented that about two weeks ago. Mm. 
Um, it's kind of new to me because I used to be, I'm so, I love being involved in everything, but um, I had to slow down a little bit because I was, I was, I wasn't getting burnt out, but it was just, you know, my mind was always racing. I never had a second to think. I couldn't think of strategic things because I was always trying to help every department. So that's kind of how we structure it now. Yeah. Um, but if you ask me in a year, I think it'll work. Yeah. But uh, hopefully it'll work. I mean, traditionally, you want, right? You want that kind of like, okay, the leadership structure to kick in and be the buffer zone between all levels of management. But uh, again, being a founder, it's kind of hard to let go of all parts of your oh, business. It's, it's like, you know, it's like having, having a kid and then they go away for university. Mm. It's like you've had your kid for third, 25 years. And they go. For me, it's the toughest part because I'm so, I was so involved, I'm so involved. And then all of a sudden he's like, okay, Sean, step back. Just do this, is what your goals will do, partnerships, whatever you're going to do. I'm taking care of the rest of the business. It's different for me because like even like, you know, tomorrow, Monday, I'm going to walk in and be like, okay. Usually I'm doing this, 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 and this. I'd call this person, give this idea, but now it's like stay away, let them do, let them, let them make mistakes. I like I encourage people to make mistakes. Yeah. Because if they're not making mistakes, they're not trying new things. So let them make the mistakes and then do it. So I've kind of pulled myself back, um, which is going to be an adjustment for me because I uh, I really do like to be involved in everything. Cool. So let's get into what AutoClose uh, actually is now. Like, you know, okay. I think the curiosity is built up enough. <laughs> let's talk a little more about AutoClose and what exactly yeah. you guys, the products you guys sell, what kind of services you guys offer. You can uh, pull it up, Dale. What do we have there? There we go. So close more deals faster. So cool. Can we go uh, break this down a little bit? So AutoClose is an all-in-one sales engagement platform with a built-in B2B database for my first business. So. What you have the ability to do inside AutoClose is say you want to build out a six to eight email sequence to um, a VP of sales <coughs> in California. Mm -hmm. You can build out your sequence. You can search our database for VPs of sales in California. You can press one button and then you can track all the results, get all the replies all in one tool so that you don't have to buy data and use an email platform. But we have it all in one. We have video emails and different things you can do inside, inside the platform. So. Um, you know, there's Aaron Ross, who's one of our clients. He's written a, written a good book, Predictable Run Review, if you haven't read that. Um, but it just helps salespeople prospect and obviously save, save hours a day in prospecting. Cool. So basically, you have this giant database and now you connect people through it through your own particular platform that can communicate to it? No. So we have a database of 37 million. And say you wanted to email, you know, 100 people in Michigan today. You can go in, you can search our database, get those 100 people, and then say, okay, I want to send them eight emails over the next 45 days. First one, introduction, second one, follow up, follow up, follow up. And they'll continue to get those follow-ups until they say, hey, I'm really interested, let's have a call. Then they stop and they're um, removed from the sequence. They continue to follow up. Because salespeople give up after one or two follow-ups, as I said earlier. Here, you can automate that and you can add all your follow-ups. You can put video in, you can put um, your Calendly in, all that stuff. And ideally, what it does is just books meetings on your calendar. That's really interesting. And the, the database is going to be captured by your first initial business. You got it. So, the, so it's white-labeled. But the database comes from Exchange Leads. It's just API integrated into white labeled into AutoClose. Both companies run side by side, but the database is fed from the first company. Yes. Cool. Can we step aside for this and talk a little more about the data collection? Yeah. Like, how do you qualify qual like you know quality data and like how that works? Yeah. So what we do for the data, first of all, it's only U.S. data mm -hmm. currently. Um, different rules in the U.K. There's different rules here in Canada. So it's all U.S. data. We have a data team out in Eastern Europe. And what happens is um, originally Exchange Leads was a crowdsourced data company. Mm. So what happened was you would have 5,000 of our clients, each would say have 10,000 contacts. They would upload those contacts into Exchange Leads. We would validate them. We would give them credits for every contact they gave us that was valid. So now their 10,000 now becomes say 15,000. But all those different people that uploaded it, our pool continued to grow and grow and grow and grow. And over four years, now we're at 28 million. So when we email people, if the email is invalid, it goes to our data team and then they actually manually check either public channels or they go on LinkedIn to make sure that person's still at that company. If they're not, they update the record, put it back into the pool. So it's continually updated on a daily basis. Um, but you know, I wouldn't sit here to say our data is hundred percent because no data is ever hundred percent. If anyone tells you it is, they're lying to you. Yeah. But we, we strive to be about 93, 94% accurate. Amazing. Sorry. And how do you test that accuracy again? We, so there's different things. We have a, a, a manual team of humans that do it. Yeah. We also ping the servers. Okay. So we'll ping the email before the email goes out to make sure that email is a valid email. Because if it's invalid, it'll tell us before we send the email out. So we do both ways. We have automation and we have some manual checking. So the, the, oh, is there right here? Exchange leads? Yeah, that's it. Yep. Perfect. So, I mean, this is interesting because like, it's almost like a, um, 
it's a smarter version of pretty much the old um, like yellow pages. Yeah. Right. The yellow pages I have is pretty much a collection of books, but like instead of just being a book that you can like flip through and and categorize and subcategorize, you now built a, like a super highly targeted tool on top of it. Right to, to now interact with this large database. Exactly. So you, you can search, you can search gender of the person. You can search employee count, revenue count, state, city, postal code. Uh, there's about 20 searches you can do, and it just continues to filter real time through the database. Um, and then before you, when you email, you might choose 100, but we only email 90 because those 10 might be invalid. Mm -hmm. They then go to the data team and they get checked, and then right back into the pool. So it's kind of like a circular. But data is a, a very interesting business because it's a lot of, it's very tough to keep a data clean because people change jobs every single day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the, the biggest data market, right? Like data is becoming like the new oil. Yeah. Um, and it's like leaking out of everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> right? oh, yeah. Everyone's trying to capture as much <laughs> of it as possible. And what is right? the good oil and what's the bad oil, I guess? <laughs> absolutely, right? Like, I mean, now this filtering and refining yeah. and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, so, I mean, interesting enough, like, that's now become like this almost, it's a closed but semi-open data market, marketplace, yeah. right? Where companies are trading data back and forth, buying companies, buying databases, all this. Like, um, like how involved are you with this kind of in the marketplace? So, I mean, a lot of people want to buy our data. Yeah. Um, companies want to acquire us because data, as you said, data is king nowadays. Um, but the problem is you got to be very careful with data. There's tons of companies that sell data. But the quality data a lot of the companies have are just, you know, they're getting big data sets from 10 years ago or five years ago even and trying to sell it. But literally every month, like 10% of data goes wrong. Mm. People change jobs, they change titles. You might say it's the same company, but you change a title. So to keep data clean, it's, it's, it's expensive. It's not easy. So I think one thing people don't spend enough time is doing their due diligence and upfront trying to make sure, okay, this data company's asked me to wire them money for the data. Mm, there's no refund. Mm, they're going to send me a test sample and it's going to be good, but they're going to get you a hundred of their best data to give it to you as a sample and say the whole database of 10,000 you're buying is that it's not. Mm. So be very careful. Try and get a reputable company. Um, that's what I would recommend if you're going to get data. And also um, anyone that says they only take wire transfers, don't do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What would you recommend payment by? Well, I mean, companies that take credit card or PayPal or even are better because A, if they actually try and um, not send you the data or give you bad data, you have a course to go back and try and get your refund. Yeah. If you do wire transfer, you're done. Once you send that money, there's no refunds. They can send you nothing Jeez. and you can't go anywhere, right? Absolutely. So, so there's companies out there that, that do that, but uh, I'd be very, very wary of them. Yeah, I mean, the data market, I mean, is something we've become like, very, very aware of now. But it's been going on for a long time. Yeah. Like I was reading about this like um, like ten years ago. The data economy then was considered like especially made in like call centers, right? Yeah. Where certain call centers would sell like you know like uh, collections. Oh, these, yeah. these are the accounts for collection. They would sell those, that database, and other parties would buy that database and then try to collect on that collectible. And that was like a whole trade of traded marketplace, oh, yeah. right? So companies would sell their like you know things that are in collections. To a company to collect on, and that company would buy it at a certain oh, yeah. value, and then try to collect on it. Yeah. I have the authority now to collect on. Call it. you four or five times a day, send you six emails, leave you ten voicemails. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Scare all the scare tactics, oh, yeah. uh, as oh, aggressive yeah. as possible. Yeah, right. I mean, like, but now it's it's not as oblique, but like, that's how this that's like the part of this economy that evolved into this larger data economy now. Right. Yeah. So I mean. Where I think we're rightful to be kind of fearful and afraid about this. Like, what are your thoughts on the data emerging data economy? Well, I think with data in general, you, you just have to go up to reputable companies. I mean, it's it's almost like anything, you know. We with the well, internet, I mean, like what's going on in the marketplace in general, right? With data privacy leakages. And, oh well, yeah, and well, buying and selling of data. Well, that's that's a big issue. The privacy is, you know, there's you know Canada put in castles. So now you can't just send people emails out of the blue in Canada. UK did something similar with with GDPR. US is still behind. Um, there are a lot of privacy. The key with us is, and what we ask people with AutoCode and the data is, if you want to be successful with the database, personalize as much as you can. Mm. Meaning, find that nugget, find that pain, find something that you can relate to in an email. If you're just going to send emails, I mean, you're going to get caught. Like, you're going to, somebody's going to complain about you. So, where do I think it's going? I think data is never going anywhere. Um, but I think, um, I think companies are being more protective over their data because nowadays you can get you can get into a lot of lawsuits if you do anything with people's private information. Yeah, 
as a, it's, it's getting more cleaned up, but like part of the part of the issue is that um, you know legal, legality wise, like the legal system is still so far behind because oh, yeah. the industry is growing so quickly yeah. and so fast. Like it wasn't for like Facebook getting in hot water like two no, years ago. Started everything. <laughs> that started the whole downward trend, right? We yeah. realized like holy crap, all this is going on, right? Like we got to be more, more careful. But uh, have you felt? Are you, do you feel like the data market is becoming more secure? Like what you're? I don't think so. I mean, no? I, 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 it's funny. Like I'll just, I'll be at my house. I'll just, I'll mention a word. I'll just say even a, like just a word. I'll say like Amazon Prime, and then I'll go on my Facebook or my Instagram and like Amazon Prime spot. Like yeah. how did they just hear me? So I think the privacy is still going on. I don't think it's ever going to change, but I think the governments and stuff are going to go after. They're not going after the small guys. They're not going after you know my company. They're going after. The Facebooks, the big ones that are really selling that privacy. Um, but I don't, th- I don't think you'll ever be able to stop, um, you know, data being sold, acquired, and presented. I mean, it's, it's a huge business. Yeah. So I don't think it's going anywhere. Do you have any ideas of like how to securitize it, how to make it more secure? Like, there's a lot of thoughts about, you know, the blockchain industry really try to sell that, yeah. right? About how it's going to revolutionize and make data more secure and safe. Yeah. But. The ideas behind it, even though the blockchain might not have any technology, is still prevalent to today's like Zygast. Yeah. Right. So, what are your thoughts on like what the future could well, be? Well, com- I think I'll tell you one thing. The future is that there was a Google actually just did something recently. We had to just go through it. So, for privacy, for example, because we have people connect their emails. So, yeah. ideally, we could have we could read people's emails through articles. Um, Google now makes you all companies that's integrating with Google have a third party audit, and the third party audit is not cheap. It's about seventy five thousand dollars. You have to pay seventy-five thousand dollars a year to Google now to audit anything that is data related on your software. Started January first this year. Oh wow! Every company. So I mean, good thing is eighty percent of my competition is gone, but the twenty percent we had to go through a Google audit. So now we're Google approved. So all these companies that have data, they have you know ten thousand Facebook and all these companies with ten thousand, fifteen thousand, hundred thousand people that you know give their personal information. If you don't pass that Google audit, Google will now not integrate with you. And Microsoft is right behind doing the same thing. So all these big companies are catching on. They're making money off it because they actually give you, you have to use company A or B and pay them. And that's the only way you can get it. So hold on. So these giant companies are basically acting like governments, putting up regulations, yeah. but they're putting a paywall in front of that regulation and profiting them. And you can't choose who does the audit. Google sent us, these are the two companies you can use, use A or B. Pay them seventy five thousand dollars. Do you know if they own either of those or? Is... I, I I mean I hadn't checked, but you, we had no choice. They actually told gave us this in September, and by, if we didn't do it by December thirty first, everyone that used our platform would get a message saying, "This is not a trusted Google uh, email." <laughs> that's that's kind of highway robbery, right? Oh, Isn't that it, that's it is. pretty aggressive? Oh, it is, and they do like they do like, all these different tests. There was about I think four hundred and seventy tests they did with our data. So. Can we? Can you find out your client's name? Can you find out their address? Can you find out the payment? Everything was checked, and they just implement this now. So I mean, I mean, all the companies that are using software, like any sales company, CRM companies, everyone is paying for this audit right now. If you're Jeez. using Google, I had no idea. Like yeah. I didn't hear about this. Like I mean, and it's yearly, <laughs> annually. So you know, in a weird way, like these companies are cleaning up the marketplace right by authenticating things. But they're taking huge sums of money to do so. Oh yeah. And the main issue with that is now it lowers barrier barrier to entry for new players. Which is good and bad. Good and bad. I mean, you know, you know, we're in a, lucky that we're in a position that you know we pay it. But there's there's cut. I saw, for example, on on a website that's selling a company that are selling. There was like five of my competitors that early on were competitors that are on there selling their companies now because they can't afford. To pay the the pay Google those seventy five the auditor seventy five thousand yeah. dollars. If you can't afford to pay them, the last thing you want is your clients now seeing that you're not a verified Google user. You're going to lose all your clients. Yeah. So they're all trying to sell their company at once, and not not telling the average person that it's because we didn't get the Google audit. So all these people are there's all these stuff on Reddit now and being like, oh, we just acquired this company and we got stuck with a seventy five thousand dollar bill <laughs> on, <laughs> on an audit. So it's something that's going around right now. Google's the first person, but I wouldn't be surprised if Microsoft right behind. That's so. I don't know. I'm pretty conflicted about how I feel about this. Oh, I'm, I'm not happy either. It was you know, you're you're doing your forecast, your budget for the year, and then boop, you got an audit you had to do. So it was uh, it was yeah. something very interesting. Um, I mean, like, as somebody who like a few years ago might not have pa- been able to pass this uh, new new hurdle, yeah, right, like on, on a growth stage. Like, how do you feel as an entrepreneur, like for the next stage of companies? Well, I mean, 
if, if, if it came down to and it was early on, I would have had to go and raise money. Yeah. I would have had to give up some equity in the company and figured I went to families and friends and raise money. Um, we were lucky in a position that, you know, we're, we're two years in and we were growing steadily. But don't get me wrong, it's still taking a good, it's still a good, good chunk of money. Mm. Um, but for, for companies that were, you know, were starting, I think the lesson is that like, you know, always have a little buffer because you never know what's going to come up. Yeah. You never know if your biggest client that sent you $30,000 is going to say, I want a full refund. Or you're not going to know if Google is going to come up with a new rule or, you know, Castle in Canada. It came out of nowhere. So if you're building a business around Canadian data, your business is shut down. So you got to be very careful. Um, and as, you know, as we talked about earlier, diversify, but also like uh, make sure you have some buffer room in your company because there's always going to be something that's going to come up that you're going to have to pay for. Yeah. And uh, I guess so we're going to wrap up soon, but uh, I'm gonna, I want to end up with this thought like, how do you feel about these giant companies right now, these trillion dollar companies? Like, I'm talking about the big five. Yeah. Like, you know, Scott Galloway's out there talking about breaking these companies up, uh, about, you know, a breach of like, um, uh, what is it? I forgot what it's called. Like, a breach of like, like uh, monopoly laws, right? Um, like, be Google being able to do these kind of moves, uh, no one can really fight back against it. No. Right? Like, what do you think is going to happen with these companies? Like, do, do they continue to grow? They're, they they're up? just going to continue growing. I think this year, all those, I think, the, I think the whole market, I think this is going to be another growth year. 2021 is where I predict there's going to be a little bit of, uh, a little pushback, a little, um, you know, election year and stuff. But I think, you know, the fangs, all those big companies, they're going to continue to go up. They yeah. have a, they're, they're just buying out companies, building new models, building new processes. Um, so I, I don't think they're going anywhere. I think they're going to just continue to grow, which is, which is terrible for some of us, but, yeah. uh, um, the rich will get richer. <laughs> the rich get richer. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but like also one of the major issues is like for these giant companies to maintain a state of growth that keeps their shareholders happy. Like the amount of growth they had to do, like just swallowing entire cities, economies, pretty oh, yeah. much of growth to keep competitive and keep going. Right. So does that drive innovation or does that stagnate growth for, for everything, everyone else? I think that's what we've got to figure out as a society, whether, you know, do we break these companies up or do they naturally, uh, other competitors come into the space? Yeah. I mean, the, the problem is, I mean, I, I, I learned just really like it's when a company is so developed and has so much money, it's almost impossible now to be a mm -hmm. competition. Like you, you can't build, you can't build something close to Facebook and think you're going to compete with Facebook. Yeah. Like you, well, you can, but get billions of dollars in funding and have a, an amazing idea. That's, but, but every, everyone has ideas. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they're going anywhere. Um, I think, you know, they, they, they're going to continue to acquire smaller companies. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, now these companies have so much cash that they can either, they don't even have to acquire now. They can just build it in house and it's going to be a lot cheaper than acquiring a small company. So that's going to kind of make it a little stagnant in the acquisition market. But uh, I don't think they're going anywhere. I think they're just going to continue to grow, grow. I mean, I think, yeah, I think it was Apple as a $1.4 trillion I was reading the other day. More liquid cash, more actual ca oh, liquid more more cash. More cash than the whole country. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. In the US, they government. are a country. Yeah, they yeah. are. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, it, it's weird because it's almost like a dystopian novel read, right? Like we look back at like the robber barons or we look back at like the East India Trading Company, those yeah. kind of days where these country, these uh, companies are the size of nations. Yeah. And pretty much helped uh, shape the world during their times. Yeah. And that's what's happening right now, right? It's almost like a, these companies are being allowed to get to get this to get this large, and now there's no power structure in, enough to yeah. break them down. Oh yeah, right. So it's interesting to see what's going to be the future of what's coming. Yeah, oh, I mean, soon enough they're just going to be their own country. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Apple's going to have its own land and its own country. Like that's where it's yeah. it's it's a it's an interesting world we live in, um, but uh, it's definitely fun time because there's a lot of opportunity, which is good. Absolutely, perfect. Um, Okay, I guess we'll wrap it up at this point. Yeah. It's been it's been an hour, man. Like this, this has been really enjoyable. Yeah, I would love to have you back another time to talk more about sales and break that down more. Yeah, but uh, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been great. Thank Thanks. you.